Uh, let's begin with some first impressions of Tolkien. Um, I'll, I'll give a bit of a, a bibliography right now because I usually forget to do so. Uh, for, for my knowledge of Tolkien's life, I highly recommend um, Humphrey Carter's biography of Tolkien. Uh, it's kind of the original biography that he wrote uh, not too long after Tolkien's death. He had a, had a chance to meet with Tolkien himself and to go through all of his papers and letters. So, so it's a very comprehensive biography. So I draw from Carpenter a lot. Also from Joseph Pierce's biography of Tolkien, uh, Tolkien, Man and Myth. Joseph Pierce will be here in town uh, next month, as a matter of fact, presenting on Tolkien um, over at the Eighth Day Institute. And he'll be here presenting on another topic the month after that. So I'd recommend uh, both of those books. Um, also, um, in relation to his uh, correspondence with C.S. Lewis, there's a couple of great biographies of C.S. Lewis that have come out in recent years by Alistair McGrath. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis, A Life, and then, which is more of a traditional biography, and then also The Intellectual World of C.S. Lewis, which goes into great detail on Lewis's ideas on myth and allegory, which um, are almost inseparable, at least at some points in his life, from that of Tolkien. So uh, I want to give a little bit of a bibliography before we start, um, and, and I'll mention some other texts perhaps after we're done that I'd recommend. All right, but, but uh, getting to Tolkien here, um, upon meeting J.R.R. Tolkien for the first time, his chief biographer, Humphrey Carpenter, that I've already mentioned, described him as resembling the archetypal Oxford Don, at, even, at times even the stage caricature of the typical Oxford Don. But that's exactly what he's not. It's rather as if, this is from Carpenter, some strange spirit had taken on the guise of an elderly professor. The body may be pacing this shabby little suburban room, but the mind is far away, roaming the plains and mountains of Middle Earth. In his own short story, Smith of Wooden Major, Tolkien described the protagonist, almost certainly self-styled, in this way as he knelt before the fairy queen. He seemed to be both in the world and in fairy, and we'll talk about what that means later, and also outside them, surveying them. Carpenter reported that Tolkien's voice was strange, deep, but without resonance, entirely English, but with some quality in it that I cannot define, as if he had come from another age or a different civilization. Tolkien was a faithful friend, a devoted husband and father, and a pious Roman Catholic. He was funny, idiosyncratic, and introspective. Tolkien was at once almost helplessly social and extroverted, yet he spent long hours alone toiling over his work, pinning private reflections in his diary, for example, in a made-up language, by the way. He was often the center of attention, many times by his own choosing, yet he always seemed to feel uncomfortable in the spotlight, or perhaps more accurately, was only comfortable being the center of attention when he was actually in the spotlight, and not while he was going about his normal business. For example, later in his life, after he'd achieved international fame, uh, when people would come calling on him at home, it made him very uncomfortable, as it would for most of us, I would think. Uh, an example of, of his kind of tendency for show, in 1938 and 1939, he had impersonated Chaucer at an Oxford performance, and he recited from memory the nun's priest tale one year, and then the next year the Reeves tale, recited from memory on stage. Right? He was not enthusiastic about drama as an art form, but he did not extend this dislike to the dramatic recitation of verse. Right? In his essay on fairy stories, he wrote, if you prefer drama to literature, as many literary critics plainly do, you're apt to misunderstand pure story making and to constrain it to the limitations of stage plays. You are, for, ex for instance, likely to prefer characters even the basest and dullest to things. Very little about trees, he said, can be gotten into a play. Mm -hmm. His intellectual life was dedicated primarily to philology, the knowledge and study of language, of which he would make an academic career, and literature, both fiction, as we all know, and which he became very famous for, but more specifically mythology, 
which occupies its own unique category, somewhat blurring the lines between fiction and history. And also, his writing bubbled over into cultural criticisms. Sometimes they were social or economical, other times religious, but they were always insightful. He was never moderate. Love, intellectual enthusiasm, distaste, <coughs> anger, self-doubt, guilt, laughter, each was in his mind exclusively and in full force when he experienced it. And at that moment, no other emotion was permitted to modify it. Okay. It was all or nothing with him. If he had been a proud man, his strong emotions would probably have made him unbearable. But he was, in fact, very humble. This is not to say that he was unaware of his own talents, but he did not consider that these talents were particularly important. That's what real humility is. With the result that in later years, fame greatly puzzled him. He wasn't sure why he was so famous. His humility resulted in a deep sense of comedy that sprang from his picture of himself as yet another feeble member of the human race. Although he disliked giving interviews, his natural courtesy made it difficult for him to turn them away. In general, he tended to like people when he first met them and then to find them irritating within a short time. <laughs> Eventually, and perhaps with this in mind, he installed an alarm clock, which he set to ring a few minutes after a visitor had arrived whereupon he would imply that he had some other matter to attend to, and he would show the caller out. In one letter, Tolkien confided to a reader that being a cult figure in one's lifetime is not at all pleasant. However, I do not find that it tends to puff me up, he said. In my case, at any rate, it makes me feel extremely small and inadequate. But even the nose of a very modest idol cannot remain entirely untickled by the sweet smell of incense, he said. He was an outspoken critic of large-scale industrialization, for example, including but not limited to the construction of roads and the overwhelming reliance on automobiles that sprung up around him in the 20th century in England, even in his beloved Oxford. He eventually turned his garage into a storage space for books and papers, his office, he called it. Uh, he didn't own a car um, from the beginning of World War II to the end of his life, didn't own a car. Okay. He pointed that out with pride, by the way. This is how he described one experience and one opinion of Rhodes belonging to the main character of his short story, Roverandum. Motor after motor racketed by, filled, Rover thought, with the same people, all making all speed and all dust and all smell to somewhere. I don't believe half of them know where they're going to, or why they're going there, or would know if they got there, grumbled Rover as he coughed and choked, and his feet got tired on the hard, gloomy, back black roads. Right? Didn't like roads. When he did drive a car, he always seemed to be in a hurry. His driving was described as daring rather than skillful. When accelerating headlong across a busy made road in Oxford in order to get into a side street, he would ignore all other vehicles and cry, charge them and they scatter, his friend said. Perhaps in part due to his distaste for coal and gasoline burning engines, Ronald didn't like to travel much. Something of his personal attitude might have been captured in his description of Farmer Giles of Ham, if you've read that short story. And that story, we're told by the narrator that at the moment when this tale begins, nothing memorable had happened in Ham for quite a long time which suited Farmer Giles, Giles down to the ground. He was a slow sort of fellow, rather set in his ways and taken up with his own affairs. Neither of them, uh, neither Farmer Giles or his dog uh, Jarm, who was a really funny character, neither of them gave much thought to the wide world outside their fields, the village, and the nearest market. Though Tolkien studied the ancient literature of many countries, he visited few of them often through force of circumstance, but perhaps partly through lack of inclination. He just didn't want to. For example, he was very passionate about the study of Welsh during the time he was an undergraduate at Oxford, um, but he never chose to go to Wales. He just didn't really have a desire to. It wouldn't have been that far of a trip. And indeed, the page of a medieval text may be more potent than the modern reality of the land that gave it birth. Uh, he was more interested in the literature than going there, right? I think it was Chesterton who said, 
that the world was never so small a place as when I traveled and never so large a place as when I was in my own backyard. Right? I think Tolkien would have agreed with that. Right? Um, during the central years of his life, the rich, richest period of creativity, he made no journeys outside the British Isles. Travel never played a large part in his life, simply because his imagination did not need to be stimulated by unfamiliar landscapes and cultures. Gradually, one forms the idea that he did not altogether care very much where he was. He wasn't a seeker of adventure or excitement, at least not what most people would describe using those terms. We'll see these tendencies come out in both The Hobbit and The Fellowship of the Ring. That's a big theme there, right? Is that this wrestling of a person from their comfort. Um, seems like he was telling some of his own life story there. He didn't want adventure. Tolkien tended to stay up late often writing his fiction or working on his complicated languages and histories, and to sleep in when he could. He, like Chesterton, seemed to think that sleeping in was a virtuous characteristic. As Chesterton said, only misers get up early in the morning, and burglars, I'm informed, get up the night before. His clothes were, in Carpenter's description, exceptionally ordinary. His manner of dressing was, of course, partly the result of circumstances, the necessity of bringing up a large family, four children, which in England at that time would have been a, a pretty large family, on a relatively small income that left nothing over for personal extravagances. But his choice of clothes was also the sign of a dislike of dandyism, right? And this would have been not too long after um, like Oscar Wilde and, and kind of this um, English fascination with, with uh, being you know, glamorous and, and overindulging in things of perceived beauty, right? This he shared with C.S. Lewis. Neither he or Lewis could abide any matter of affectation and dress, which seemed to them to smack of the unmasculine and hence of the objectionable. Lewis took this to extremes, not only buying indifferent clothes, but wearing them indifferently. Uh, Tolkien, on the other hand, always the more fastidious, at least kept his trousers pressed, right? Lewis kind of prided himself on being sloppy. Um, Tolkien at least cared about his appearance to some degree, but certainly not buying fancy clothes or, or caring much about whether they match perfectly or not. Um, humility and simplicity would always be a hallmark of Tolkien's life. Even in his affluent later years, the Tolkien's owned no television, nor a washing machine or a dishwasher. He not only didn't seem to need or desire modern machines, he seemed to distrust them in many ways, both serious and sometimes humorous. For example, uh, George Sayer, uh, who, who was a close friend of C.S. Lewis, who used to frequent uh, some of the Inglings meetings, uh, one time had the opportunity to record Tolkien reading and singing from The Hobbit and from the typescript of The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien had never before encountered a tape recorder, at least not up close at this time, and he pretended to regard Sayer's machine with great suspicion pronouncing the Lord's Prayer in Gothic into the microphone to cast out any devils that might be lurking within. Very suspicious. In his spiritual life, Tolkien was very scrupulous. He generally only went to communion when it was immediately preceded by confession. And he was very disappointed in the introduction of the vernacular in Mass. He once, uh, kind of off the record, uh, not in one of his, his official papers, but uh, he once compared the resourcement theme of the Second Vatican Council with a group of men with shovels digging around a great oak tree trying to find the acorn from which it had sprung. Okay. Not a big fan of, of uh, some of the, the changes that would ensue after Vatican II. He could be described as melancholic, though not pessimistic. Big difference between those two descriptions. Melancholic but not pessimistic. He once wrote, I do not expect history to be anything but a long defeat, though it contains some samples or glimpses of final victory. His was a realistic view of life that recognized human sin and human impotence. But it also never lost sight of the hope that assured him that every battle would in fact be won in the end. Okay. Very Catholic worldview. Uh, part of his, his life that many people haven't seen uh, is this kind of mystical part of his spirituality. 
Now, his friend C.S. Lewis would become a famous apologist after his conversion, while Ronald, I'll probably go back and forth, um, he was known by uh, Tollers, he was known by John, he was known by John Ronald, J.R.R. Tolkien, okay, so sometimes I'll call him Ronald. Um, so J.R.R. Tolkien, um, who had himself been one of the instrumental causes for Lewis's conversion, you've probably heard about that story, he himself never published a work explicitly about the faith. But his letters give us a glimpse of an intensely spiritual man with tremendous speculative depth. One somewhat well-known example is found in a letter that he wrote to his son Christopher, which he wrote about an experience that he had during Eucharistic adoration, in which Tolkien articulates an analogy in beautiful detail. You can find this online and read the whole text. In beautiful detail, he, he describes um, a ray of light gleaming through the window and a moat suspended in the air which is illuminated by the ray, right? So something floating in the air that, that is caught right in a ray of light. Tolkien explained to Christopher that, quote, the ray was the guardian angel of the moat, not a thing interposed between God and the creature, but God's very attention itself personified. That's how he described angels, okay? So he had this great spiritual sensibility, um, but it was very private, right? This comes from his, a, letter, a private letter that he wrote, or he thought was private until it was published later on. Somewhat ironically, as the man who would become one of the most famous fiction writers of the 20th century, Tolkien himself did not care much for contemporary fiction. According to him, as a young Oxford graduate, he rarely read a novel. For him, English literature ended with Chaucer. Or, to put it another way, he received all the enjoyment and stimulus that he could possibly require from the great poems of the Old and Middle English periods and from the early literature of Iceland. And though I've identified Tolkien as the author of fiction, he would probably disagree with me. Tolkien spoke about the Lord of the Rings not as a work of fiction, but as a chronicle of actual events, and seemed to consider himself more of a historian than an author. When a friend, G.B. Smith, who was a very close friend of his that we'll talk about later, asked him what one of his poems was about, Tolkien replied, I don't know. I'll try to find out. I don't know. I'll try to find out. He did not say of an apparent contradiction in the narrative that this is not a, as I wish it to be. I must change it. That wasn't his reaction if, if something didn't come out right in his story. Instead, he would approach the problem with the attitude, what does this mean? He did not see himself as an inventor of story, but as a discoverer of legend. His was a unique brand of storytelling which would react to the assumption that it was all made up with reproach. And he'd be offended by that, saying the story was made up. In other words, his stories had much more in common with ancient mythologies than with conventional fiction. For them, or for him, the term fiction just wasn't sufficient to explain what he was trying to convey through his work. His work was too important to be, to, to be described as mere fiction. It was too precise, and it was far too real for him. I want to talk a little bit about his family history here, because um, it's kind of interesting. Tolkien's mother, Mabel Suffield, <clears throat> married Arthur Tolkien after a three-year engagement. Um, her father had insisted on this delay uh, for a couple of reasons. One was because of her age. She was 18 at the time that she agreed to marry Arthur, who was 13 years older. So he's 31, she was 18. Uh, and perhaps because he secretly hoped that a man with better prospects would come along, right? So maybe if I make you be engaged for three years, maybe you'll get a better offer. Um, the two exchanged secret letters, and they were only allowed to see each other at family gatherings under the eyes of many chaperones. The Tolkien family had been reasonably successful piano makers, but Arthur's father had gone bankrupt. Arthur became a banker working in Lloyd's Bank in Birmingham, and due to slow promotion prospects and his desire to start a family, he looked for a more promising employment in South Africa, which had at the time an expanding banking business due to the gold and diamond discoveries at the time. After establishing himself in Cape Town, Mabel's father accepted the betrothal grudgingly as he felt that the Tolkien family, which had only been English for a few generations, didn't have the proud tradition that the Suffields had formerly had, even though he himself had also gone bankrupt, um, just like Arthur's father. 
John Suffield would never really warm up to Arthur or to the Tolkien lineage. Um, for example, uh, much later in May of 1923, John Suffield, um, so J.R.R. Tolkien's grandfather, was 90 years old and he was living with Tolkien and his family. And John Ronald uh, uh, had pneumonia and he was really, really sick. And he remembered his grandfather, quote, from, this is from a letter from Tolkien, standing by my bedside, looking at me and speaking to me in contempt, to the effect that I and my generation were degenerate weaklings. There I was, gasping for breath, he wrote. His grandfather never really warmed up to the Tolkiens. After a long engagement, and despite Mr. Suffield's misgivings, Arthur Real Tolkien, so, so his second R in his name is a family name, um, and Mabel Suffield, J.R.R.'s parents, were married in April of 1891. John Ronald Rule was their first child, born on January 3rd, 1892, in Bloemfontein, South Africa. In the late 19th century, even city life in South Africa was somewhat remote and untamed, certainly for English like Mabel Suffield, uh, used to living in, in a fairly well-developed city, industrial as it was. On occasion, lions would roam into town. J.R.R. was bit by a tarantula when he was just learning to walk. He reportedly ran in terror across the garden until the nurse snatched him up and sucked out the poison. When he grew up, he could remember a hot day and running in fear through long dead grass, but the memory of the tarantula itself faded and he said that the incident left him with no special dislike of spiders. Nevertheless, in his stories, he wrote more than once of monstrous spiders with venomous bites. Uh, so some examples that come to mind are when the whole company of dwarves was captured by spiders, and that was kind of when, when Bilbo had his chance to show his heroism for the first time, was freeing them from the spider. Um, also, uh, of, of course, Shelob, the, the female spider, um, near the climactic scene of The Lord of the Rings. Um, also, not, not nearly as famous, but even in his story, Rove Random, a spider is mentioned as ha having almost devoured the man in the, mo the moon's dog when he first fell there from the edge of the world. So spiders crop up in his stories quite a bit. Nevertheless, J.R.R. seemed to be happy for the most part in South Africa, and he gained some experience that, experiences that seemed to have stuck with him in some way, even if he didn't retain specific memories of them. For example, young Ronald had much exposure to gardening during his years in South Africa. In the early morning and late afternoon, he would be taken into the garden where he would watch his father tending the vines or planting saplings. During the first year of the boy's life, Arthur Tolkien made a small grove of cypresses, firs, and cedars. Perhaps this had something to do with the deep love of trees that would develop in Ronald. His mother, Mabel, grew tired of the South African weather and the tiresome social life in Bloemfontein, but Arthur, her husband, was very fond of it. Um, it saddened her greatly that Arthur didn't see this as a temporary job. He wanted to stay in South Africa forever. He even didn't want to come back to visit um, England. Um, the only clear memory J.R.R. would have of his father in South Africa would be of him writing A.R. Tolkien on the family trunk as he prepared to send Mabel and the two boys, John Ronald and his younger brother Hillary, to England on holiday in April of 1895, when Ronald was three. In addition to her continuous homesickness, Mabel wanted to take Ronald to a cooler climate back home in hopes that it would improve his health. Um, he'd had a, a number of illnesses as a young child, and um, it was thought, at least by Mabel, that they were kind of heat-related. Arthur did not accompany them because of his work. Firstly, he would have had to take half pay while he was away, and secondly, because he felt he needed to stay on account of some urgent happenings in bank business at the time. In these days of competition, Arthur wrote to his father, one does not like to leave one's business in the hands of others. After sailing to England, Mabel and the boys stayed with Mabel's parents in Birmingham through the spring and summer. Arthur wrote that he missed his family and he longed to see them, but there was always something preventing his, his voyage to England. In November, Mabel received news that Arthur had contracted rheumatic fever. He had partially recovered, he said, but he still couldn't bear an English winter in his weakened condition. In January, Arthur was still in poor health, so Mabel decided that she needed to pack up the boys and return to Bloemfontein to take care of Arthur. Arthur. 
and excited John Ronald at age four dictated the following letter on February 14, 1896. My dear daddy, I'm so glad I'm coming back to see you. It is such a long time since we came away from you. I hope the ship will bring us all back to you, Mamie and baby and me. I know you will be so glad to have a letter from your little Ronald. It is such a long time since I wrote to you. I am got such a big man now because I've got a man's coat and a man's bodice. Mamie says you will not even know baby or me because we've gotten to be such big men. Hillary sends lots of love and kisses and so does your loving Ronald. Arthur would never have the chance to read this letter from his son, nor he would ever see him again on this earth. Arthur Tolkien died the next day after suffering a severe hemorrhage, and he was buried 5,000 miles away from Mabel and from his boys, before his family even received word that he had died. He was in the ground. Mabel and the boys would remain with her parents, so their maternal grandparents, at first until Mabel could make plans for their future. Mabel decided to educate the boys herself, at least at first, and in addition to the natural qualification of being their own mother, she had the attributes of knowing Latin, French, and German, and being skilled in painting, drawing, and playing the piano. From very early on in their new lives and their unplanned circumstances in Birmingham, Mabel made it a priority to find a home in the country where the boys could have fresh air, have open spaces, and have natural surroundings. Despite the loss of their father and their poverty, um, she did have some income, but it was relatively small. He, uh, Arthur had made some investments that paid dividends that she was able to sustain a, a meager living, um, but it was meager. Despite this poverty, Mabel was determined that the boys could still be happy and they could receive a pleasant and proper upbringing. John Ronald's paternal grandfather died six months after his father did, no doubt adding to the boys' grief and a sense of loneliness back in Birmingham. Perhaps as a way to strengthen his sense of Tolkien identity after the death of both his father and his grandfather, Ronald's Aunt Grace, so his father's younger sister, would tell Ronald fanciful stories as to how the Tolkiens had come to live in England and about the origins of the family name, weaving tales of a distant relative who was nicknamed Tolkien, meaning foolhardy, after leading a daring raid for Archduke Ferdinand of Austria against the Turks in the Siege of Vienna in 1529. A later relative, she said, fled from France in 1794 to escape the guillotine and had taken the name Tolkien, setting up shop as a clock repairer. I mention these stories because in his own writing, Tolkien would go to great lengths to tell stories about how people came to live where they lived and about how they came to have the names that they would have. By the summer of 1896, Mabel Tolkien had found somewhere cheap enough for herself and the children to live independently. And they moved out of Birmingham to the hamlet of Serholt, a mile or so beyond the southern edge of the city. The effect of this move on Ronald was deep and permanent. Just at the age when his imagination was opening out, he found himself in the English countryside. A letter from his brother, Hilary Tolkien, Reflecting on he and Ronald's childhood adventures in Serhole, said this, We spent lovely summers just picking flowers and trespassing. The black ogre, uh, this was a farmer who once chased Ronald for picking mushrooms, used to take people's shoes and stockings from the bank where they'd left them to paddle and run away with them and make them go and ask for them. And then he'd thrash them, he said. The white ogre, uh, the name that they gave to the owner of the mill that the Tolkien boys used to explore around. Uh, here's some pictures of the Sarehole Mill. The white ogre wasn't quite so bad, but in order to get to the place where we used the blackberry, called the Dell, we had to go through the white ogre's land, and he didn't like us very much because the path was narrow through his field, and we traipsed off after cockles and other pretty things. If you remember, Frodo uh, and Mary uh, had a similar reputation when, when they and Pippin would go uh, traipsing through the Shire. And there was, there was a scene where a farmer was after them in a similar way. The Serhole Mill made quite an impression on the Tolkien boys. And they were fascinated with the wheel turning in its dark cavern, the belts and pulleys and shafts, 
and the still pool with swans swimming on it that plunged over a sluice to the wheel. They found it to be dangerous and exciting. <coughs> it's even been commemorated uh, by the Tolkien Society. The Tolkien boys, as we mentioned, were homeschooled by their mother, Mabel. Ronald could read by the time that he was four. His favorite lessons were those that concerned languages. He loved Latin. His mother taught him French as well, but he didn't like it as much as Latin. He didn't like the sound of French words as well as he liked the sound of, of Latin words. So this is how much Tolkien was into language. He, he would talk about you know, the way it comes off the tongue. Um, he was drawn to the sounds and the individual syllables of language. Ronald also loved to draw, especially landscapes and trees. He became knowledgeable in botany, particularly the shape and feel uh, of plants, not the scientific details. <coughs> Though he liked drawing trees, wrote Humphrey Carpenter, he liked most of all to be with trees. He would climb them, lean against them, even talk to them. It saddened him to discover that not everyone shared his feelings toward them. One incident in particular remained firmly in his memory. This is what Ronald would later write. There was a willow hanging over the mill pool, and I had learned to climb it. It belonged to a butcher on the Stratford Road, I think. One day they cut it down. They didn't do anything with it. The log just lay there. I never forgot that. As a boy, Tolkien was amused by Alice in Wonderland, though he said he didn't have any desires to have adventures like Alice. He did not enjoy Treasure Island, nor did he like the stories of Hans Christian Andersen, nor the Pied Piper. But he liked Red Indian stories, and he said he longed to shoot with a bow and arrow. He loved George MacDonald's stories about a remote kingdom where misshapen and malevolent goblins lurked beneath the mountains. One of his favorite stories was the tale of Sigurd who slew the dragon Fafnir, which was found in Andrew Lang's Red Fairy Book. He said, I desired dragons with a profound desire. Of course, I and my timid body did not wish to have them in the neighborhood. But the world that contained even the imagination of Fafnir was richer and more beautiful at whatever cost of peril. Mabel converted to the Catholic Church in June of 1900, along with her sister, Mary, May. Until this point, Mabel had received a little financial help from Walter Incladon, her sister May's husband. But he withdrew all assistance after Mabel's conversion. He also promptly returned to Birmingham from South Africa, and he forbade his wife from ever entering a Catholic Church again. Walter was an Anglican. And John Suffield, the father of Mabel and May, was at first a Methodist and then a Unitarian. Many of the Tolkens were Baptists, and all became hostile to Mabel. But against all this opposition, she began to instruct Ronald and Hillary in the Catholic religion. In September of 1900, uh, Ronald was age seven. He entered King Edward's school in Birmingham, paid for, uh, it's, it's this one. This was paid for um, by one of the few relatives that, that wasn't ill disposed towards Mabel. They couldn't afford train fare, so Ronald had to mostly walk the four miles from Serhole to Birmingham. This clearly couldn't continue. So regretfully, Mabel found a house to rent nearer to the city center. Late in 1900, she and the boys packed their belongings and left the cottage where they'd been so happy for four years. And she moved to a rental house in Mosley, nearer the center of the city. Four years, Tolkien would recall in his old age of his days in Serhole, but the longest seeming and the most formative of my life, he said. In contrast, Tolkien described the time spent at the small house in Mosley as dreadful. Trams, traffic, and the drab faces of passers-by filled the foreground, and in the distance the smoking factory chimneys of Sparkbrook and Small Heath dominated the skyline. They moved again shortly after that, um, but the next house wasn't much better. The house backed onto a railway, li railway line so that daily life was disrupted by the roar of trains and the shunting of trucks in the nearby coal yard. The wrenching of the young boy from the rural life he loved to the urban existence he loathed would have lasting consequences. 
writes Joseph Pierce in his biography that I mentioned earlier, Tolkien, Man and Myth. According to Pierce, this move formed the basis of the creative tension which would animate the contrasting visions of life and landscape in Middle Earth. Okay. It's a big theme for Tolkien, the destruction of landscape. King Edward's, his school, was cramped, crowded, and noisy. It presented a daunting prospect to a boy who had been brought up in a quiet country village. And not surprisingly, Ronald Tolkien spent much of his first term absent from school because of ill health. But gradually, he became accustomed to the rough and tumble and the noise, and indeed, he grew to like it. Although he did not as yet show any outstanding aptitude in his classwork. The family moved houses again soon, soon after coming to the city. Um, uh, and one highlight um, during the, this kind of period of transition and, and this constant exposure to the industrialism and particularly the railways was that he uh, liked reading the Welsh names on the railway cars. So he would, he would look at the names printed on the cars um, and it kind of fueled his curiosity. Um, Mabel didn't like their house, nor did she care for the local church. She found a church more to her liking at the Birmingham Oratory, which was founded by John Henry Newman. Um, it had an attached school run by its clergy called the Grammar School of St. Philip. The fees were lower there than at King Edward's, and there her sons could receive a Catholic education. The deciding factor was that there was a house to rent next door. Early in 1902, the boys were enrolled at St. Philip's. There she met a priest named Father Francis Morgan. Father Morgan had been an associate of Cardinal Newman's and would soon become a dear friend of Mabel's and an indispensable part of the Tolkien household. Though it was a Catholic education, the boys' experience at St. Philip's was not a very good one. Uh, it was located in a slummy part of town for one, uh, and its bare brick classrooms were a poor substitute for the Gothic splendors of King Edward's. Uh, also, uh, it appears that the academic um, offerings were not quite on par with, with King Edward's. Ronald was ahead of his classmates, so Mabel decided once again to begin teaching him herself at home. He would soon re-enroll at King Edward's um, after he was able to earn a scholarship there. And so he'd go back there. Um, at King Edward's, one of Ronald's influential teachers was a man named George Brewerton, who specialized in English literature. He encouraged his pupils to read Chaucer, and he recited the Canterbury Tales to them in the original Middle English. To Ronald's ears, this was a revelation, and he determined to learn more about the history of the language. Ronald would later become fascinated with Anglo-Saxon, or Old English, um, and two of his favorite stories in that language being Beowulf, um, and he has a translation of, of Beowulf, and also Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. He also has a translation of that, an original translation. The works of Shakespeare, on the other hand, Ronald, quote, disliked cordially. In a high school debate on the subject of Shakespeare, the school magazine reported that Tolkien poured a sudden flood of unqualified abuse upon Shakespeare, upon his filthy birthplace, his squalid surroundings, and his sordid character. Not a Shakespeare fan. Mabel let her mother-in-law know through a letter that Ronald would begin making his first Holy Communion at Christmas in 1903. It is a great, very great feast indeed to us this year, she wrote. I don't say this to vex you. Remember, she was hostile to the Catholic faith. I don't say this to vex you. Only you say that you like to know everything about them. I think maybe Mabel did delight in vexing her mother-in-law with this announcement at least a little bit. In April of 1904, Mabel was hospitalized after a long decline in health, which was hastened by the added fatigue caused in recent months by her constant nursing of both Ronald and Hillary, uh, who had had just a whole slew of illnesses, uh, measles, whooping cough, um, and also pneumonia. So she was sick herself, and then her sons got sick, so she got worse. The previous fall, she had written of her fear that fatigue and sickness would soon make it impossible to go on. By spring, this fear had been realized. The boys were sent temporarily to live with relatives as Mabel was no longer able to care for them. Father Morgan was able to arrange for the family to move into a small residence on the grounds of the oratory's retreat house where they would have someone to cook and keep house for them. It proved to be an ideal place for all of their recuperation 
Mabel had finally been diagnosed with diabetes, and at the time there were no insulin treatments. It was as if they had come back to Searhole. The cottage lay on the corner of a quiet country lane, and behind it were the wooded grounds of the oratory house, with a little cemetery adjoining the chapel where the oratory fathers and Newman himself were buried. The boys, according to a letter written by Mabel to her mother-in-law, the one that wanted to know everything, they spent their days bilberry gathering, having tea, kite flying with Father Francis, sketching, and tree climbing. In Tolkien's short story, Roverandum, the main character is led to a mysterious moon valley where he experiences an extraordinary scene of boys and girls dreaming, fast asleep on earth, but transported somehow to this magical place. Passage from that story. He saw below a garden in twilight, and as he looked, it changed to the soft glow of an afternoon sun, though he could not see where this soft light came from that lit all that sheltered place, and it never strayed beyond. Gray fountains were there, and long lawns, and children everywhere, dancing sleepily, walking dreamily, and talking to themselves. Some stirred as if just waking from deep sleep. Some were already running, wide awake and laughing. They were digging, gathering flowers, building tents and houses, chasing butterflies, kicking balls, climbing trees, and all were singing. One of the boys there in the story spoke to the man on the moon, another character. Do dreams come true, he asked. Some of mine do, said the old man, some but not all, and seldom any of them straight away or quite like they were in dreaming them. The Tolkien's time in Rednall seemed like a pleasant dream after the loss of Arthur and the loss of their beloved home in Serhol. But this dream was not to last. The boys regained their strength tremendously during this wonderful summer holiday at the retreat house, but Mabel's health, however, continued to deteriorate. On November 14, 1904, with Father Francis at her, and her sister at her bedside, she died after sinking into a diabetic coma six days earlier. John Ronald was just 12 years old. He would later write of her, My own dear mother was a martyr indeed, and it is not to everybody that God grants so easy a way to his great gifts as he did to Hillary and myself, giving us a mother who killed herself with labor and trouble to ensure us keeping the faith. The loss of his mother had a profound effect on his personality. It made him into a pessimist, or rather, as Carpenter puts it, it made him into two people. He was by nature a cheerful, almost irrepressible person with a great zest for life. He loved good talk and physical activity. He had a deep sense of humor and a great capacity for making friends. But from now onwards, there was a second side, more private, but predominant in his diaries and in his letters. This side of him was cap capable of bouts of profound despair, and it had a deep sense of impending loss. Nothing was safe. Nothing would last. No battle would be won forever. Uh, this picture was taken uh, shortly after the death of their mother. Ronald and Hillary, Ronald on the left, 13, uh, and his brother Hillary, 11 years old, about a year after their mother's death, uh, or sorry, about six months after. The boys were taken in by Father Morgan, who had been appointed their guardian in Mabel's will. Father Morgan was wary of Suffield or Tolkien relatives who might try to lead the boys away from their Catholic faith. But luckily, he was able to find an aunt with no particular religious views who lived near the Birmingham Oratory, who had a room available. And as it turned out, Father Morgan need not have feared the influence of the Methodists, the Baptists, the Unitarians, or even the nuns in John, in O-N-E-S, not, in, not in U-N-S, in John Ronald's extended family, because young Tolkien's faith would grow even stronger after the loss of his mother. He grew to love the Catholic faith ever more intensely after Mabel's death. It might be said that after she died, his religion took the place in his affections that she had previously occupied. Ronald would remember and honor his late mother by continuing to love the things that she had loved. 
not only through his practice of the ancient faith that she had passed on to him, but also in his desire for learning and in his deep appreciation of nature. He pursued the study of language in particular because she had introduced him to its study. She had taught him to love it. With the loss of his mother came the loss of the open countryside, which they had both loved. The forced move from the retreat grounds in Rednall back to Birmingham made him miss his mother even more and was a constant reminder of her absence. Because it was the loss of his mother that had taken him away from all these things, he came to associate them with her. His feelings toward the rural landscape, already sharp from the earlier severance that had already taken him from Serhol, now became emotionally charged with personal bereavement. This love for the memory of the countryside of his youth was later to become a central part of his writing, and it was intimately bound up with his love for the memory of his mother. Do dreams come true? Some of mine do. Some, but not all. And seldom any of them straight away, or quite like they were in dreaming them. Um, with new loves, education, friends, and romance. So despite this tragedy, the loss of his mother, which followed not too uh, far behind the loss of his father and his grandfather, despite this tragedy, or in, perhaps in part because of it, John Ronald would continue to show more and more academic acumen as his high school years progressed. One influential teacher of note was headmaster Robert Carey Gilson, which was the father of Robert Gilson, who would be one of his best friends in the school. Um, R.C. Gilson was skilled in the classics but he was also an amateur scientist and inventor. I found this character really interesting. Um, among Gilson's inventions were a windmill that charged batteries to provide electric light for his house, a specialized hectograph, which um, is a kind of rudimentary copier that uses like a gelatin to make copies. So he invented this specialized hectograph which duplicated the school exam papers even though uh, Tolkien said that you couldn't hardly read them, but nevertheless. Um, he also invented a small gun that could shoot golf balls. Um, and when teaching, Gilson encouraged his, people, his pupils to explore the byways of learning and to be expert in everything that came their way. This was an example that made a great impression on Tolkien. Um, Tolkien despised laziness and lack of skill. And you see that in his works, right? Uh, particularly in essential things. Now, he wasn't concerned with technology, as we've talked about, or at least advanced technology. Um, but he did find it very important to be um, attuned to the normal things of, of everyday life uh, and to be able to kind of be somewhat self-sufficient. Uh, for example, he wrote about the dragon and the goblins in The Hobbit, particularly as not being able to fix anything. That was one of their characteristics, he said. And in fact, the downfall of smog, as you might remember, was uh, in part due to a damaged um, you know, uh, breast uh, plate, uh, a damaged scale that ought to have been fixed, is what Tolkien implies. Um, but he didn't mend it because he was either too lazy or didn't know how to, and that ended up why he, why he died. Uh, Tolkien's love of language soon led him to begin inventing language, starting with a childhood amusement among him and his friends and his siblings, creating simple languages by combining and disguising various words from English, French, and Latin, right? So not as rudimentary as like pig Latin, but, but that kind of idea, right? You just kind of, a very low level, you kind of make a new language based on words you know, and you just change them a little bit. Um, but starting with that, but moving ever more complex, uh, and becoming more systematic as he got older and as he gained more linguistic skill. He would later remark, an enormously greater number of children have what you might call a creative element in them than is usually supposed. And it isn't necessarily limited to certain things. They may not want to paint or draw or care about music, he says, but nevertheless, they want to create something. And if the main mass of education takes a linguistic form, which it does, right? Most of the way we educate children comes through language. If it takes a linguistic form, then their creation also will take a linguistic form. So he wasn't surprised at all um, with his own fascination with language. He assumed that everybody should be creating language. That's the normal way that we take in information, and that, that's the normal means by which we might create something. He says, very interesting. Early in 1908, Father Francis found new lodgings for the boys with a lady who lived behind the oratory and rented rooms to several lodgers. 
The boys hadn't been happy staying with their aunt, who did little for them beyond providing room and board. On one occasion, for example, she burned a bunch of things that had belonged to Mabel, not out of purposeful, purposeful cruelty, but simply out of callous neglect, not thinking about the fact that Ronald might have cherished those few things that he still possessed, which had belonged to his departed mother. So she, so she was very absent, um, kind of cold towards the boys. One of the other boarders at the Tolkien's new residence was a 19-year-old girl named Edith Bratt. She was an illegitimate child and may not have ever even known the identity of her own father. If she did, she never shared it with any of her own children, at least not that they reported. And she too had been orphaned at 13 when her mother died. Edith and Ronald, Ronald was age 16 at the time, soon became friends and by the next summer they had fallen in love. Father Francis, spurred by an incident when Ronald and Edith snuck off together for the day to have a bicycle ride in the country, not too bad for today's standards, I would think, but um, he decided that Edith was a distraction to Ronald's studies. He demanded that the affair be ended and arranged for new lodgings for the Tolkien boys. Shortly after Father Morgan ordered Ronald to break off this relationship with Edith, he had to go to Oxford to take the scholarship exam. He failed to receive an award. He wrote in his diary on New Year's Day, 1910, depressed and as much in dark as ever. God help me. I feel weak and weary. He and Edith, while still obeying Father Morgan's orders, for the most part, still wrote to each other and on one occasion decided to meet clandestinely to exchange birthday gifts, gifts to celebrate his 18th birthday and her 21st birthday. Somehow, Father Morgan once again found out about this meeting and this time commanded Ronald not to communicate with Edith again until he turned 21 and therefore would no longer be under the guardianship of Father Morgan. Ronald would likewise obey this new, even harsher demand. He would continue, however, to see her accidentally on occasion. Here are some of Ronald's journal entries from this time period. Last night, prayed that I'd see E by accident. Prayer answered. Saw her at 12.55 at Prince of Wales. I told her I could not write. Happier, but so much longed to see her just once to cheer her up. Cannot think of anything else. Several days after this, this entry, he wrote, I saw a dejected little figure sloshing along in a Mac and Tweed hat and could not resist crossing and saying a word of love and cheerfulness. This cheered me up for a little while. Prayed and thought hard. Somehow, he must have had uh, eyes everywhere, Father Morgan would once again find out about at least one of these chance encounters, and he wrote angrily to Ronald, calling his actions evil and foolish, and threatening to pull him out of school if he persisted. Ronald wrote, I cannot see E, nor write at all. God help me. Saw E at midday, but could not be with her. I owe all to Father M, and so must obey. Edith decided to move to new lodgings further away, which would make it easier for Ronald to obey Father Morgan's command. In spite of this ban, Ronald prayed that he might at least catch a final glimpse of her on the day that she was to leave town. At Francis Road Corner, he writes in his diary, she passed me on a bike on the way to the station. I shall not see her again, perhaps for three years, he wrote in his, this diary. Edith's move, though obviously difficult for Ronald, seems to have helped him remain obedient to Father Morgan's command to postpone any further Congress with Edith until he turned 21. He would also have many school and social activities that may not have kept his mind off of her, but at least kept him positively occupied. Ronald excelled at rugby, making up for his small size with his ferocity. He was described as being slightly less than average height. Uh, Humphrey Carpenter says, that he was less than average height, not much, but enough to be noticeable. Right? He was just a little small. After meeting Edith, he seemed to become more courageous, more confident, more aggressive. Ronald also enjoyed debate, and his linguistic talent served him well in his debating sessions. There was a custom at King Edwards of holding a debate entirely in Latin, but that was almost too easy for Tolkien. And in one debate, when taking the role of a Greek ambassador to the Senate, he spoke entirely in Greek. He also, on different occasions, debated in fluent Gothic and fluent Anglo-Saxon 
This was as a high school student. Anyway, not sure if I knew English very well when I was in high school. In December of 1910, Tolkien won a scholarship from Oxford. This was his second attempt at that. His achievement was impressive, but still a bit disappointing considering his abilities. It wasn't as high of an award as he probably ought to have, have won. He admitted that his preparations had been a bit light due to his attention to rugby and his other interests, including mythology, which had taken off during this, his final year at King Edwards. As a senior, he became interested in Finnish mythological poetry and wrote of, quote, this strange people and these new gods, this race of unhypocritical low-brow, scandalous heroes. The more I read of it, he said, the more I felt at home and enjoyed myself. Before the Inklings ever existed, there was the Tea Club. This was a group of librarians, senior boys at King Edwards who were given the task of maintaining the library, basically, who met regularly for tea and for discussion. The club had four members, Christopher Wiseman, G.B. Smith, Robert Gilson, and John Ronald. Common to these three enthusiastic schoolboys was a thorough knowledge of Latin and Greek literature, and from this balance of similar and dissimilar tastes, shared and unshared language, or knowledge, friendship would grow. Wiseman was knowledgeable about natural sciences, music, and math. Robert Gilson, who was the son of that kind of strange headmaster that we talked about. He was interested in drawing and design, in Renaissance painting, and in 18th century history. John Ronald contributed his interest in philology and in northern writings. They later changed their name to the Barovian Society when they began meeting at Barrow Stores Tea Room and would later identify themselves as the TCBS. These letters were even attached to their names in the school chronicle, of which Christopher Wiseman was the editor. During Christmas vacation in 1914, the four young men, which were college students now, were able to get together for a reunion of sorts. After this get together, Christopher Reisman, Wiseman wrote that, quote, they felt four times the intellectual size when they were together. It was through this reunion that Tolkien decided to begin writing poetry. Afterwards, he explained that this meeting had helped him to find a voice for all kind of pent-up things, he said. Tolkien would write wistfully about the inspiration that even a few hours with the four brought to all of us. So this is, uh, you can see my circle there. This is uh, John Ronald here and uh, Rob Gilson with some other students at King Edwards. In the summer holiday following graduation from King Edwards, J.R., along with his brother Hillary and some other friends, went on a trip to Switzerland. Uh, here's a journal entry that he wrote uh, on that trip. The menfolk slept rough, Tolkien remembered, often in haylofts or cow buyers, since we were walking by map and avoided roads. One day we went on a long march with guides up to the Aletsch Glacier when I came near to perishing. Uh, apparently there was a rock slide called, uh, caused by melting snow. He says, anything from the size of oranges to large footballs and a few much larger. They were whizzing across our path and plunging into the ravine. At one point a rock shot about a foot at most before my unmanly knees. Later they climbed with guides up to a high hut of the Alpine Club roped, uh, he said, or I should have fallen to the snow crevasse. And I remember the dazzling whiteness of the tumbled snow desert between us and the black horn of the Matterhorn some miles away. Uh, it reminded me a bit of uh, the journey of Frodo and his companions in the Lord of the Rings, right? Um, just the, the basic idea of walking being such an important part of all of those stories, but particularly the uh, avalanche scene in the Fellowship of the Ring. On this trip, he bought a postcard of a reproduction of a German painting called Der Bergeist, the mountain spirit. Tolkien preserved this postcard carefully, and long afterwards he wrote on the paper cover in which he kept it, Origin of Gandalf. At Oxford, Ronald was involved in a number of activities, for example, the Essay Club, the Dialectical Society, 
and the College Debating Society, and he even started his own club called the Apollostics, which meant those devoted to self-indulgence, he said. There were papers, discussions, and debates, and there were also large and extravagant dinners. It was one degree more sophisticated than the teas in the school library, but it was an expression of the same instinct that had helped to create the TCBS. Indeed, Tolkien was at his happiest in groups of cronies where there was good talk, plenty of tobacco, and male company. In the summer vacation of 1912, after completing his first term, Tolkien went to camp for two weeks with King Edward's horse, a territorial cavalry regiment in which he had recently enrolled. He enjoyed the experience of galloping across the Kentish Plains, but it was a wet and windy fortnight and the tents were often blown down in the night. This taste of life on horseback and under canvas was enough for him, and he resigned from the regiment after a few months. When the camp had concluded, he went on a walking holiday in Berkshire, sketching the villages and climbing the downs. As the clock struck midnight and marked the beginning of January 3rd, 1913, his 21st birthday and his coming of age, he sat up in bed and wrote a letter to Edith, renewing his declaration of love and asking her, how long will it be before we can be joined together before God and the world? But when Edith wrote in reply, it was to say that she was engaged to be married to a man named George Field, brother of her school friend Molly. Though shocked and disappointed, Tolkien wouldn't be discouraged by this news and would promptly write back to begin the process of reclaiming the woman he had considered to be his rightful fiancée. Edith had hinted in her letter that she had agreed to George Field's proposal because she had assumed that Ronald had moved on with his life without her. Unfortunately for Mr. Field, his proposal to Edith would soon be followed by a counterproposal from Ronald. Edith would, avoiding offense to Mr. Field to the best of her ability, rescind her acceptance of his proposal and accept the new one now on offer from Ronald. With Father Morgan's prohibition now out of the way, there was only one major problem facing the young couple. If they were to marry, Edith would have to become Catholic. She wasn't opposed to this, but was apprehensive about leaving her Anglican parish, at which she had become a very active member, for a church where she didn't know anyone. She was also afraid that her uncle, with whom she was currently living, would kick her out if she converted. So she wanted to wait until closer to the wedding to join the Catholic Church. But Ronald would not hear of this. He wanted her to act quickly. He despised the Church of England, calling it, quote, a pathetic and shadowy medley of half-remembered traditions and mutilated beliefs. And if Edith were persecuted for her decision to become a Catholic, after all, that was what had happened to his own dear mother, and she had endured it. I do so dearly believe, he wrote to Edith, that no half-heartedness and no worldly fear must turn aside from following the light unflinchingly. It could be said that Middle Earth and the stories of the Silmarillion, the Hobbit, and the Lord of the Rings began to be created around this point in Tolkien's life. While he wouldn't actually start writing the Silmarillion for another couple of years, you could say that he had begun to write the story that made the Silmarillion and all that followed it by writing the story of the language of Middle Earth. By 1915, Tolkien had developed his invented language that he'd been working on for quite some time to a degree of some complexity. And the more he worked on it, the more he felt that it needed a history to support it. In other words, you cannot have a language without a race of people to speak it. He was perfecting the language. Now he had to decide to whom it belonged. It was also around this time that England would become increasingly involved in World War I. Conscription began in Britain in January of 1916, but even before that, Tolkien would begin voluntary training. It was common, especially for educated young men, to enlist for officer training in Oxford and Leeds, for example, with prospects of a better position in the war than if they waited to be drafted. C.S. Lewis, for example, did the same thing. During army training, Ronald wrote, these gray days wasted in wearily going over, over and over again, the dreary topics, the dull backwaters of the art of killing are not enjoyable. By the beginning of 1916, he had decided to specialize in signaling. For the prospect of dealing with words, messages, and codes was more appealing than the drudgery and responsibility of commanding a platoon. So he learned Morse code, flag and disk signaling, 
the transmission of messages by heliograph and lamp, the use of signal rockets and field telephones, and even how to handle carrier pigeons. Ronald and Edith would be married on March 22, 1916, shortly before he was deployed to France to prepare for the Battle of the Somme. Ronald's experience in the trenches certainly had an effect on the way that he portrayed evil in The Lord of the Rings. The savage cruelty of the orcs, Saruman's disregard for all life, including not only men, hobbits, elves, and dwarves, but also of trees. The destruction of trees is highlighted, as we've talked about many times in the trilogy. Uh, the breeding evil of Mordor, casting dark shadows across all of Middle-earth and threatening to envelop it with its choking grip. Ronald also had a marked experience of the less heinous but still offensive coarse and immoral behavior of many of his fellow soldiers. He was disgusted by the moral fabric of many of the men he served with, particularly the officers. At the same time, though, he was inspired by a select few that would make a lasting impression on his memory and show forth in his stories. Ronald was impressed especially by many of the officers' servants. My Sam Gamgee, he wrote, is indeed a reflection of the English soldier, of the privates and the batmen I knew in the 1914 war and recognized as so far superior to myself. So batmen, um, the bat was the, was the case in, in the personal effects of the officer. So there would be a private assigned to the officer to take care of his stuff, basically. And so Sam Gamgee was largely that for Frodo. Ronald would fight in the Battle of the Somme, which began on July 1st, 1916. On the first day of the battle, 20,000 Allied troops were killed, including Rob Gilson of the TCBS, who died leading his men into action. A letter to Ronald from G.B. Smith said, I am safe, but what does that matter? Now one realizes in despair what the TCBS really was. Oh, my dear John Ronald, whatever are we going to do? These young men were very dear friends. In October, Ronald caught trench fever and would eventually be sent home. Soon thereafter, he received a letter from Christopher Wiseman, who was serving in the Navy, telling him that G.B. Smith had died from injuries caused by an exploding shell. Shortly before he died, G.B. Smith had written a letter to Ronald. Here are some excerpts from that letter, which would be one of Smith's last communications. My chief consolation is that if I am scupped tonight, there will still be left a member of the great TCBS to voice what I dreamed about and what we all agreed upon. For the death of one of its members cannot, I am determined, dissolve the TCBS. Death can make us loathsome and helpless as individuals, but it cannot put an end to the immortal form. May God bless you, my dear John Ronald, and may you say the things I have tried to say long after I am not there to say them, if such be my lot. Yours ever, GBS. As if answering Smith's dying exhortation, Ronald started work on the Salmarillion while on sick leave from the war in 1917. He went on and off sick leave a couple of times before finally being dismissed for good. Uh, he, he, he was seriously ill. I mean, he wasn't faking or anything like that. Um, but it was clear that he was eager to come home and that he wanted nothing more to do with the Great War. Ronald and Edith's first baby was born in November 1917. They named him John Francis after Father Francis Morgan, this man who had kept them apart for so long. So he still had great respect for this priest. John would be ordained a Catholic priest after himself serving in World War II. After the war, Ronald got a job as an assistant lexicographer in the production of the Oxford New English Dictionary on which work had begun way back in 1878. Tolkien's task was researching the etymology of words. He would later say that he learned more in those two years, 1919 and 1920, than in any other equal period in my life. He also earned some extra income tutoring pupils at Oxford, primarily from women's colleges. Um, he was an attractive tutor. Um, not only was he a great teacher, but also for the fact that he was married. Um, meaning that the ladies wouldn't need to be escorted by a chaperone. 
Okay, um, being being married as an Oxford Don was quite rare at the time. Um, not many years before that, it was impossible to be married as an Oxford Don um, because they basically took a they were basically ordained as members of the Anglican clergy, so they had to be celibate not too long before this, um, and certainly couldn't be Catholic, because uh, they had to take an oath and swear by the 39 articles. In 1920, he got his first university post as a reader in English language at the University of Leeds in Northern England. Edith gave birth to their second son, Michael Hillary Reuel, all of them have that, the second R, Reuel, around this same time. Michael won the George Medal the, the St. George Medal in the Second World War for his service as an anti-aircraft gunner defending aerodromes in the Battle of Britain, so the, the airfields. The family remained in Oxford at first before accompanying John Ronald to Leeds. At Leeds, Tolkien and a colleague in the English department helped to form a Viking club among the undergraduates, which met to drink large quantities of beer, read sagas, sagas, and to sing comic songs. Sounds like a fun group. Tolkien became a professor. Uh, a new post, in fact, was established in English language just for him at Leeds. Um, and he became professor at the age of 32, remarkably young by the standards of British universities. His third son was born in 1924, Christopher, after Christopher Wiseman, rural Tolkien. Like his older brothers before him, Christopher, too, would serve in World War II being called up into the Royal Air Force in early 1944, which greatly distressed his father, uh, John Ronald. Tolkien believed that aerial warfare was both immoral, um, kind of a separation from hand-to-hand -hand combat, it was, it was more immoral and it was excessively dangerous. So he, he was very upset about this. Tolkien seems to have had the most in common with this, his youngest son. Tolkien would describe Christopher as a nervy, irritable, cross-grained, self-tormenting, cheeky person. Yet there is something intensely lovable about him, to me at any rate, from the very similarity between us. Christopher would follow his father's footsteps as a teacher, and he would help Ronald in his writing, doing things like um, going through his copious notes, editing, um, working on his maps. And in fact, some of his works that Tolkien was concerned he wouldn't have time to finish before he died, Christopher was assigned to finish those works for him, and, and Christopher continued to be influential in publishing his works uh, and, uh, up to today. As we've already seen, being in the company of other males with shared interests was an extremely important part of Tolkien's life. We've seen it primarily with Christopher Wiseman, G.B. Smith, and Rob Gilson in the Tea Club and the Barovian Society. And we've even seen this need pop up again in Tolkien's brief time at the University of Leeds with the Viking Club. Discussion societies, for men only, would continue to be essential for Tolkien during his tenure at Oxford, continuing to cultivate the seeds that had been planted by his mother Mabel and fertilized, if you will, by the TCBS. At Oxford, Tolkien would organize an informal reading club called the Colbitar, or the Colbiters, meaning those who lounge so close to the fire in winter that they bite the coal. It was based somewhat on the model of the Viking Club in Leeds, except that its members were all dons rather than a mix of, of teachers and students as it had been at Leeds. They met for an evening several times each term to read Icelandic sagas, right? the, the myths of, of Iceland. Ronald met Clive Staples Lewis, who he would call Jack, at an English faculty meeting in May 1926, and a year later invited him to attend the Colbiters. This group was something as a forerunner to another group that would go down in literary history known as the Inklings. Unlike the Colbiters, which was indisputably led by Tolkien, um, he's the one who organized it, it was kind of all based on his ideas and his interests, the Inklings, on the other hand, revolved around Lewis. The group generally met on Thursdays during the day at some public house, often at the Eagle and Child, or sometimes the Lamb and Flag, or the White Horse, and on Thursday nights in Lewis's rooms at Magdalen College. By the late 1930s, the Inklings were an important part of Tolkien's life. In addition to their regular Inklings meetings, Tolkien and Lewis met regularly on Monday mornings, just the two of them, often talking for an hour or two, and then concluding with beer at the East Gate. Uh, Tolkien would later end up living very near the, the East Gate. It's a bit unclear 
as to how Edith felt about Ronald spending so much time with his friends, not only away from her physically, but also away from her intellectually. I think this is an interesting part of his life um, that he doesn't really talk about much. It seems that she felt some resentment to the fact that Ronald had, in effect, two separate lives, one at home with her, which was very ordinary, um, though Ronald was loving and chivalrous and even reportedly somewhat romantic, at least according to him, uh, and another life with his male friends, with whom he shared such a robust intellectual camaraderie. In other words, he talked about things with his friends that he just didn't talk about with her. Okay, very different relationship. While their marriage would always be a strong one, it wasn't without its disagreements and even grudges. And it seems that Ronald's social life was sometimes a cause for friction between he and Edith. Right? Tolkien would later write to one of his sons who was at the time contemplating marriage. He was trying to give him advice. And he says, there are many things that man feels are legitimate even though they cause a fuss. Let him not lie about them to his wife. Cut them out. Or, if it's worth a fight, just insist. Such matters may arise frequently, he says. The glass of beer, the pipe, the other friend, etc., etc. If the other side's claims really are unreasonable, they are much better met by above-board refusal than by subterfuge. Okay. So it's interesting. He had some, some uh, probably pretty good advice to his son, but, it, but it's clear that, to me, the backstory of that is that he had a lot of Kind of disagreements at home about the time that he was spending with his friends. Um, and I'm not sure, honestly, that I, I agree um, probably with all the time that he did spend, although we see the fruit uh, of that. It was an interesting thing that he seemed to have really needed. He seemed to really depend upon that um, camaraderie. One day, as he was marking papers on Northmore Road, he often, for extra income, would um, serve as an examiner, okay, basically, basically grading papers. One time when he was doing this, an idea came to him. One of the candidates, this is, he's writing about it after the fact, had mercifully left one of the pages with no writing on it, which, he says, is the best thing that can possibly happen to an examiner. And I wrote on it, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Names always generate a story in my mind, he wrote. Eventually, I thought I'd better find out what hobbits were like. But that's only the beginning. The actual writing of The Hobbit was begun around 1930 and completed late in 1932, but Tolkien began creating the stories well before this uh, and told tales to his sons that would later be formalized. It would finally be published on September 21st, 1937. Wow, we're close to the anniversary right now. It could be said that Tolkien's children literature really began with his Father Christmas letters which would arrive at the Tolkien house, complete with pictures and decorated, decorated envelopes signed by Father Christmas himself and bearing handmade postage from the North Pole. Let's see if you can make it, I'm not sure if you can make it out on, the, on this image, but uh, very detailed um, handmade postage. Uh, not sure if you can read any of that. You can find some more of these pictures online. The Hobbit, likewise, oh wait, another, I've got another one. Uh, illustration, the polar bear falling down the stairs. Um, and, and these would later be published. The Hobbit, likewise, was written for children, especially Tolkien's own children. But Tolkien points out that it is an error to consider fairy stories as being only for children. According to him, this error comes from the all too common mistake of thinking of children as, quote, a special kind of creature, almost a different race, rather than as normal, if immature, members of a particular family, the human family at large. He says we shouldn't think of children as something different than us. Fairy stories have, he says, been relegated to the nursery as shabby or old fashioned furniture is relegated to the playroom primarily because the adults did not want it and did not mind if it's misused. Tolkien believed that the taste for fairy stories is innate to each person and does not decrease but increases with age. He says not everybody has it, but those that do have it, it's not diminished with age, it increases, right? We kind of have this idea that, oh, fairy, story, 
fairy stories, children are interested in them, but then they grow out of them and, and you know, they think they're silly after that. He says it's not the case. If you have a desire for them, it increases with age. And as strong as his desire was to write for children, just as strong, if not stronger, was his insistence, especially in his later years, that children ought not be spoken down to. I'm not interested in the child as such, he would say, and certainly have no intention of meeting him or her halfway, or a quarter of the way. It is a mistaken thing to do anyway, either useless when applied to the stupid, he says, or pernicious when inflicted to the gifted. He adamantly opposed the tendency of some authors and some parents and some teachers to dumb things down or to try to make them overly clear-cut and easy to understand. He despised authors who patronized children or, deadliest of all, he said, covertly sniggering with an eye on the other grown-ups present. Right? I see this a lot. I mean, I've got little kids. I see this a lot in uh, particularly children's uh, TV shows and movies, right? jokes that are for adults that are meant to sail over the kids' heads. That's what he's talking about here, covertly sniggering with an eye on the other grown-ups present, right? He, he despised that. His views on the literary tool of allegory give us a glimpse of what he means to do and what he means to avoid in his writing for children, and his writing for adults, for that matter, too. Uh, here's a couple other family pictures of the Tolkien's. The quality's not great. This is Tolkien and all of the kids here. Um, looks like in both of these, uh, Christopher is missing. So it looks like John uh, and Michael and uh, Priscilla. According to Tolkien, many conf confuse applicability with allegory. This is a key distinction for him. But the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purposed domination of the author. Okay. I dislike allegory wherever I smell it, Tolkien said. C.S. Lewis articulated this careful distinction about allegory in a letter that he wrote to Tolkien after Tolkien had shared a particular poem that he had written with him at one of their meetings. Lewis said that the poem had quote, mythical value, the essence of a myth being, in Lewis's view at least, that it should have no taint of allegory to the maker and yet su should suggest incipient allegories to the reader. So allegory shouldn't exist in the mind of the author, um, it, should, it should spring forth from the mind of the reader, right? So we apply things that we find in the writing in ways that the author never intended. Or as Tolkien would put it, Far greater things may color the mind in dealing with the lesser things of a fairy story. After the publication of The Lord of the Rings, many commentators tried to assign allegorical significance to the stories, claiming that Mordor represented Russia, right, this evil, talking about it being in the East, for example, the ring represented the atomic bomb, etc. But Tolkien himself contended that the books were not written with any contemporary political situations in mind but rather that the world had begun to conform itself to the stories in strange, unexpected, and certainly unintended ways. And while he did shed light on some of his inspirations for particular parts of his stories, he insists that his work was the product of his entire intellectual experience, almost a subconscious one, rather than of any particular occurrences from the past or any predicted events in the future. When asked about the inspirations behind the stories, Tolkien stated, one writes such a story not out of the leaves of trees still to be observed, nor by means of botany and soil science, but it grows like a seed in the dark, out of the leaf mold of the mind, out of all that has been seen or thought or read, that has long ago been forgotten, descending into the deeps. That's how he got his inspiration. Okay? It wasn't from something that popped into his head or, or something in a newspaper. Um, it was from the depths of his imagination. Tolkien delivered the Andrew Lang Lecture at the University of St. Andrews on March 8, 1939. It was in the midst of writing The Fellowship of the Ring. He was asked to give this talk. The main contents of this lecture would later become his essay on fairy stories, which I have heard a man recite from memory in dramatic form. It's very impressive. 
In this essay, Tolkien explains that fairy stories are not stories about fairies or elves, but stories about fairy, the realm or state in which fairies have their being. These stories, although fictional, must be true in the sense that the author must become a true sub-creator. According to Tolkien, the successful author makes a secondary world which your mind can enter. Inside it, what he relates is true. It accords to the laws of that world. You therefore believe it while you are, as it were, inside. The moment disbelief arises, the spell is broken. The magic or art has failed. And while the story must be believable based on the characteristics of that secondary world, it doesn't necessarily have to seem possible, at least not according to the characteristics of the primary world, of our world, right? Fairy stories plainly were not primarily concerned with possibility, wrote Tolkien, but with desirability. Okay. So the, the hero of a, of a fairy story isn't going to balk if he or she thinks that it's impossible based on the laws of our world. It's more about whether it's desirable, he says. The distinctive feature of a great fairy story is, for Tolkien, the happy ending, which he would later assert to be an absolute necessity. More specifically, Tolkien recognized the power of what he called the eucatastrophe, or the good upturning, or, or literally, um, right, the, the, the strophe is, is like a, a part uh, of a poem. So the, a catastrophe is when basically the story falls apart, but a eucatastrophe is when it falls apart in a good way, if that makes any sense. Okay. And the power of a eucatastrophe to resonate with our human experience and God's, was of, and God's experience of intervening in history and of reshaping history. Okay? So, he, so he recognizes that a eucatastrophe is something that we all sense to be um, part of our experience, particularly if we have a religious sense. Okay? And, and so here he, in his essay on fairy stories, uh, he goes on to, to bring it all together in saying that the gospel itself is the great eucatastrophe. And it's through the lens of the gospel that we appropriate all of these stories and why they're meaningful. Right? The best fairy story for Tolkien is one in which all seems to be lost, but then something entirely unexpected and improbable happens, through which the entire story is changed for the good. Tolkien realized that eucatastrophe was not just a feature of his stories or even of other good fictional stories. He realized that it was the main feature of all stories that deserve to be told. It was the story of the gospel itself. It was the way that God has created and continues to inspire all human stories. Tolkien wrote his short story, Leaf by Niggle, in the midst of trying to finish The Lord of the Rings. The story is about a man, Niggle, who can't seem to finish his magnum opus, his, his great work, this painting of a tree, which had begun with a single leaf. You see, Niggle was good at painting individual leaves, he poured over them and he painted them with great detail and great delight. But he had now filled a huge canvas and he couldn't quite get the assembled tree together just right. Okay, this is what Tolkien was experiencing in his own work. Niggle is constantly interrupted and even beleaguered by those who want him to use his canvas to patch a leaky roof next door. Right? So why are you doing this artwork? Somebody's roof is leaking. Tear up this canvas and use it for that. In the course of the story, Niggle gets more and more anxious, worried that he will never complete his painting. Eventually, he's whisked away from his work, and he undergoes a death-like transition. Now remember, Tolkien doesn't use simple allegories, so the reader isn't sure whether Niggle has actually died or not, but he certainly has had a surrounding, and his perspective changed. He ends up being placed on a train, and this is what, he happens, what happens when he gets off the train. Niggle pushed open the gate, jumped on the bicycle, which happened to be his own bicycle from back home, which is, which is a mysterious part of the story, and he went bowling downhill in the spring sunshine. Before long, he found that the path on which he had started had disappeared, and the bicycle was rolling along over marvelous turf. It was green and close, and yet he could see every blade distinctly. He seemed to remember having seen or dreamed of that sweep of grass somewhere or other, the curves of the land were familiar somehow. Yes, the ground was becoming level, as it should, and now, of course, it was beginning to rise again. 
A great green shadow came between him and the sun. Miggle looked up and fell off his bicycle. Before him stood the tree, his tree, finished. If you could say that of a tree that was alive, its leaves opening, its branches growing and bending in the wind that Niggle had so often felt or guessed and had so often failed to catch. He gazed at the tree and slowly he lifted up his arms and opened them wide. It's a gift. Like Niggle, Tolkien just never could seem to finish his tree. In a letter to his son Christopher, he humorously, though perfectly true to the way that he viewed his art, told him that, quote, a new character has come on the scene. I'm sure I did not invent him, he said. I did not even want him, though I like him. But there he came, walking to the woods of Ithilien. It was Faramir, the brother of Boromir, and he's holding up the catastrophe by a lot of stuff about the history of Gondor and Rohan. If he goes on much more, a lot of them will have to be removed to the appendices, where already some fascinating material on the Hobbit tobacco industry and the languages of the West have already gone. Such a creative mind. Lewis once said of Tolkien that the mere suggestion of publication usually set him upon a revision, in the course of which so many new ideas occurred to him that where his friends had hoped for the final text of an old work, they actually got the first draft of a new one. So why did Tolkien have so much trouble wrapping up his story? Christopher Wiseman perhaps shed some light on Tolkien's perfectionism, which is really perfectionlessism, right? He can't get it perfect. He's not a perfectionist, he's a perfectionlessist. In this insightful letter to Ronald, Wiseman says, why these creatures live to you is because you are still creating them. I think this harkens back to very well to Tolkien's idea on subcreation. When you have finished creating them, they will be as dead to you as the atoms that make our food. In other words, Tolkien did not want to finish because he could not contemplate the thought of having no more creating to do inside his invented world, his subcreation, as he would later call it. Tolkien recognized that we become like God by being co-creators, and in this sense, those who are closest to God are those who create skillfully and durably, okay, things that last. For example, the immortal elves in The Lord of the Rings continue to exist precisely because their creative capabilities have not been dimmed by the fall, right? This is why they appear to be magical, when really they are just pure and good, in touch with the true and the beautiful, the way we are all meant to be. Okay, in one great scene in The Lord of the Rings, um, they're evaluating this, these gifts that they've received from the elves, and they appear to be magical cloaks. But upon further, further consideration, they're just beautiful cloaks, but they experience them as being magical. Right? It tells a lot about the creative abilities of the elves. They use the natural resources in ways that are totally um, consistent with, with their nature. Nevertheless, Tolkien would eventually finish his book, thankfully for us. He read the last chapters of The Lord of the Rings to the Lewis brothers, C.S. and his brother uh, Warren, or Warney, as he called them, and Charles Williams in the White Horse Pub. And Tolkien reported that C.S. Lewis was, quote, affected to tears by the last chapter of book four, and that he himself actually wept when writing the account of the hero's welcome that is given to the hobbits on the field of Cormallan. Ronald and Edith would retire to a seaside neighborhood in Bournemouth on the southern coast of England, not far from the Miramar Hotel, where he and Edith had vacationed for years. While in some ways this lifestyle suited Ronald, it's clear that the move was primarily the desire of Edith and that she enjoyed it much more than he did. Uh, although he looks pretty content there to me. In his diary he wrote, I can get nothing done between staleness and boredom, confined to quarters and anxiety and distraction. What am I going to do? Be sucked down into residence in a hotel or old people's home? without books or contacts or talk with men. God help me. His beloved wife Edith died November 29th, 1971. After this, Tolkien moved back to Oxford, not far from the Eastgate Hotel that he and Lewis had frequented together, where he remained for the last two years of his life. J.R.R. Tolkien died at age 81 on September 2nd, 1973. 
Even little Niggle in his old home could glimpse the mountains far away, and they got into the borders of his picture. Tolkien had written this, perhaps with himself in mind. But what they are really like, and what lies beyond them, only those can say who have climbed them. Tolkien leaves, with us, leaves us with a literary legacy that not only delights, but continues to inspire and to fortify. He reminds us, as he did in a letter to Christopher, that wars are always lost, and the war always goes on, and it's no good growing faint. His message is not one of pessimism, no, far from it. It's a message of realism. It's a message of hope. This is the, uh, his, the tombstone uh, for he and his wife. You see that he's given them the names of Luthien and Baron, if you're familiar with the story from the summer early on, which has recently been republished, I believe in June of this year. It was published as a, as a standalone edition. That's how he considered his wife. Um, the story of, of, a, of a maiden who chose um, mortality, someone who was, who was inherently immor immortal, who chose to die to be with the one she loved. He was asked to give a toast after a speech in 1958, just a few years after the publication of The Lord of the Rings, and he said this. I look east, west, north, south. I do not see Sauron, but I see that Saruman has many descendants. We hobbits have against them no magic weapons. Yet, my gentle hobbits, I give you this toast to the hobbits. May they outlast the Saramans and see spring again in the trees. I'll conclude with a passage from his short story, Smith of Witten Major. In it, Tolkien tells the story of a boy who unknowingly comes into the possession of a fae star, a star from the land of fairy. It had remained with him, the narrator tells us, tucked away in some place where it could not be felt. For that's what it was intended to do. There it waited for a long time, until its day came. The boy woke up early on his tenth birthday before the sun came up. He looked out of the window and the world seemed quiet and expectant. A little breeze cool and fragrant, stirred the waking trees. Then the dawn came, and far away he heard the dawn song of the birds beginning, growing as it came towards him, until it rushed over him, filling all the land around the house, and it passed on like a wave of music into the west, as the sun rose above the rim of the world. It reminds me of Fairy, he heard himself say, but in Fairy the people sing too. Then he began to sing, high and clear, in strange words that he seemed to know by heart. The boy would grow to manhood throughout the story, and the face star would have a great effect upon him, upon his work, and upon everyone around him. The star was his passport, you see, into fairy. This is a, a one artist's rendering of, of Smith's journeys, many journeys into fairy, and we'll tell the whole story. It was his passport into fairy. It was the land that inspired him, nourished him, and constantly called him to come home. One day he would realize that his time with it was coming to an end, but that the Fae Star would continue to work its magic in the world through the next young boy who would come into its possession. He was sad that his time was running short. He wanted more opportunity to create, more experiences, more time, as we all do. But he was consoled by these words from the Queen of Fairy, better a little than no memory of Fairy at all. For some, the only glimpse. For some, the awakening. Thank you for your attention.